I'm Daniel Minty, a cognitive behavioral therapist, teacher, and writer. Therapeutic alliance, or the relationship between therapists and their patients, provides the foundation for our work together. I recently spoke with my friend and colleague, Heather Clegg, MD, about therapeutic alliance. Heather is a psychiatrist in Berkeley, California, and like myself, teaches and writes about CBT. Please join us now. So thanks, Heather, for joining me this afternoon to talk about therapeutic alliance. In 1906, Sigmund Freud wrote a letter to his friend Carl Jung. And in the letter, he said, healing is achieved through love. I think this might be the first mention in the world literature of what today you and I would call therapeutic alliance. It's been looked at quite closely since Freud's time, certainly. And many studies have found a moderate and reliable association between therapeutic alliance and positive treatment outcomes. A recent meta-analysis of 24 studies found alliance more predictive of positive treatment outcome than any other factor measured, including the type of therapy itself. This week I searched PubMed and found studies that correlated therapeutic alliance with recovery from anxiety and depression, but also chronic pain, schizophrenia, anorexia, and stroke. There have been a lot of reliable and valid instruments developed to rate therapeutic alliance. Most of these measure two things. One, the bond between the therapist and patient. And two, the degree of collaboration in their work. As cognitive behavioral therapists, you and I know attachment or bonding supports collaboration. And that together, these form the foundation from which a patient's going to be more willing to do things like psychotherapy homework, which is a core ingredient in effective CBT. You have long experience in the field, and I'm curious what comes to mind when you think of those factors that the therapist and the patient would bring to the relationship that would strengthen the bond between them. Um, I, I love this idea of kind of holding, thinking about the two poles that you mentioned. One would be the bond between the therapist and the patient, and the other is the, collaborative, the collaborativity of the relationship and how those two things um, can work hopefully for each other. Um, and, and you mentioned um, research showing that the therapeutic alliance predicts outcome. Um, I think there's also some research showing that early progress in treatment predicts therapeutic alliance. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you think of the, the bond as a sort of warmth, a sense of warmth, trusting um, connection between two human beings, and the collaboration is their ability to work together towards a common goal, you could see how those two things could really reinforce each other. Hmm. So one of the factors that would lead to bonding would be early progress in therapy. I think so, yeah. You can imagine that if someone gets a sense that, hey, this person can really help me, it might really increase their sense of trust and excitement to pursue further goals and treatment. Seems especially important if the uh, patient is a therapy veteran, has had 10, 15, 20 therapists, and is still quite depressed to see us for some number of sessions and not feel much different, might reinforce a perception that therapy doesn't work or it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. Whereas noticing change in the first week, second week, I could see would create an interest in working, a respect, a sense that maybe finally I'm on the right track here, working with Heather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, yeah, you can just sort of see them as two, <laughs> two things that really could work together. 
What would be some other qualities that both parties would bring that would create that bond? Yeah, um, that's a great question too. Um, so if you think of, again, if we think of the bond as the component of feeling kind of warmth, connection, and trust, on the therapist side, if you, you probably want to be reliable. You want to show up when you say you're going to show up. You want to respond in predictably um, patient and compassionate ways. You want to be interested in the, ther in the patient's experience, um, kind of bringing a sense of, of curiosity uh, and um, probably also to the extent possible, some capacity to help soothe the patient, right? If your presence is generally calming to the, to the patient, they're going to, that's going to instill more sense of trust. And then, you know, you'd want to be encouraging. You, as a patient, you'd want to be with someone who kind of could see you and understand you and see what your potential was and be able to encourage you to move forward to become your best self. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the way that we use our empathy to, to warmly understand someone and also positively encourage them on the therapist side, I would think would um, greatly enhance the bond with the patient. Mm -hmm. All of those sound important. My ear pricked up, especially when you talked about being encouraging. It seems a core piece. And when I think about how I encourage a new patient, say, it's oftentimes by telling them, I have helped many people over the years with precisely your presenting problem. And I would love to help you with that presenting problem. And if you're willing to work with me uh, along the guidelines that I lay out, I think there's an excellent probability that like many, many people before you, you could recover from that depression or the anxiety or the PTSD. And patients believe me when I say that. And oftentimes after a first session, they say what they liked best was that they felt hope. And perhaps they'd not felt hope for a long time. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was beautifully embedded in what you said was a sense of seeing the patient as an active agent in their change, right? That if they're willing to follow the guidelines, we often talk about doing psychotherapy homework, um, that that they're, you're, you're helping them understand that they're going to be playing an active role uh, in, in healing themselves, um, which can feel very empowering to have someone see that part of you. Absolutely. I, I tell my patients that most everything people bring to me, um, anxiety, depression, are things that I've experienced. So we're on a human continuum when we talk about these diagnostic uh, categories. And that as human beings, we can encourage and support each other's feeling better. So I want to level the playing field right away and get out of this doctor-patient business and just be walking around on the planet as human beings talking about what we've learned. And the work that I do is uh, absolutely collaborative. What would be some elements in your experience that would build successful collaboration? Um, well, you, uh, something you were demonstrating was clear expectations, being very transparent with the patient about what you have to offer and what they would have to put on the table in order for change to happen. Um, so that, um, I mean, I think one trap that some folks can fall into is seeing themselves as a victim of circumstance and feeling kind of helpless or passive and wanting to be rescued by a therapist. And that's not a collaborative stance. If a patient brought that into the treatment, that wouldn't be a collaborative mindset. So to be meeting that with a clear explanation, a description of, of the nature of collaboration and that each of you is gonna bring, each of us is gonna bring something to the work we do together, um, I think can help start to shift that mindset and have people mm -hmm. have patient realize that, again, there are two, this is a meeting of two equals. Mm -hmm. Is another element in your experience uh, sharing goals? The literature talks about this to the extent that 
the therapist and patient have the same goals, the collaboration is stronger and the therapy goes better. That, absolutely. I mean, the, the act of asking someone to express their goals, I think, can be so helpful and clarifying because often what we think we want might not turn out to be what we actually are, are, are wanting when, when we are able to sit with someone who can take the time to help us sort that out. And so exactly to be explicitly on the same page about what the goals are absolutely would enhance collaboration. Mm -hmm. We can call that just sharing an agenda for the, our work, mm -hmm. as opposed to the therapist trying to sell something to the patient or vice versa, patient trying to convince the therapist about something. Being clear what it is that we're able and willing to work towards, and then setting up the work that would produce measurable progress towards that sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I think one thing that um, therapists can do, and maybe that just said this, but is to help in a, in a patient and compassionate way, in an encouraging way even, help patients understand that they may not 100% want what, they're, what they think they're asking for. Hmm. Um, and it can, I think, be experienced as a form of deep empathy to pause and say, what would that look like if you really got what you said you wanted? Mm. Would there be reasons why you might not, you know, jump for that? Mm. I think that's so important. An image I use with new patients is they have one foot in the world of change because they're in my office saying, I want to help with my panic attacks or my, my flashbacks from the war or something like that. But there's one foot still in the status quo, which is why they're in my office, that they're suffering, they're not sleeping well, they're feeling isolated from important people in their lives. And so there's a foot in both worlds. That's the nature of entering therapy or entering a spiritual path, or entering a new intimate relationship. We're partially in, partially out. And I tell the patients that I like to focus on the back foot because that's where they are today. And it's a bit paradoxical because I think a lot of therapists want to talk about how great recovery is and how wonderful their technology is to help someone get there, et cetera. There's a role for that. My starting point is looking at exactly what you're describing, the reasons too, to have a panic disorder have uh, PTSD symptoms to experience depression or chemical dependency. Right, to think about what, what will be lost if they lift that back foot uh, and what is actually maybe even beautiful about things as they are right now. Yeah. You've mentioned one thing a patient might do that would get in the way of collaboration and that would be coming in, experiencing themselves as a victim of, of depression, say, or of anxiety, what would be some other therapy interfering behaviors that patients might bring to us or that you've experienced, patients bringing to you in your practice? Yeah, I think, um, well, one example is, is resistance to collaboration itself. Mm -hmm. I'm working with a patient, um, and it felt sort of at every step like we were tugging, having some sort of tug of war. Um, and so I, I paused us to kind of talk about what that dynamic seemed to be happening between us. And um, what she was able to say was um, kind of how threatening it felt to get help. Um, and uh, that that felt very scary to her and to, to lose control, to not have all the answers and know ahead of time was very frightening to her. So she, she had some active resistance to actually engaging with me in a collaborative way. Mm. It's lovely that you were able to articulate that, point that out and process that with the patient. She was actually, I just want to point out that she was actually the one who was able to formulate it, ah. which became this beautiful moment of collaboration. <laughs> 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 oh, that's lovelier yet. 
How about from the therapist side? What therapy interfering behaviors have you engaged in yourself? I know you teach a lot of therapists, uh, CBT. What are some things we as therapists do that get in the way of collaborate, collaborating with our patients? Mm -hmm. Well, we might have some of the same collaborative struggles. Um, in fact, maybe similar to my patient. Um, I really like to be right <laughs> and to be in control. <laughs> and, um, so I, I will sometimes fall into taking over and, and doing, playing some of the role that's actually my patient's role, um, and which is, ends up uh, really jeopardizing the alliance uh, and the collaboration, because I'm not a good person to do that, and I'm getting in the way of their doing it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe an example of that would be, um, if I can think of a good example of that, well, one would be thinking I know what the patient should want for themselves. Yeah, well, we're only talking about distorted perceptions. <laughs> <laughs> a therapy interfering behavior that I engage in, and I think it's true of most all of the therapists that I train, is that I don't do homework. <laughs> so um, I know that getting training and case consultation, reading work that uh, enlarges the field, looking at the research, is uh, an integral part of my staying alive as a, a therapist. I think you have said to me that as healers, we're either moving forward or we're moving back that there's no such thing as just staying where we are. And I know that I'm slower sometimes than I might prefer to be to access those resources, get that consultation. And just as many of our patients are reluctant to do their written CBT homework, to do their exposure, to try new ways of talking with loved ones, I feel the same resistance myself to doing new things. And I think to the extent that I uh, manifest that resistance, it gets in the way of uh, collaborating successfully with my patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could think of, um, you know, the collaboration, I mean, therapy is asymmetrical, but it is mutual. And um, I don't think the patient can grow if we don't grow with them. And it's obviously the relationship is for the purpose of the patient's growth. But um, yeah, if we're not actively engaged, as you said, in sort of expanding uh, our own learning, um, I don't think we can match, can, can share that with them and, and participate with them. Which, and this is another sort of paradox, that sometimes when we get stuck with a patient, it's really an amazingly wonderful opportunity certainly for the treatment, because often getting through a therapeutic impasse can unlock some problem that the patient brought the patient to therapy to begin with. But it's also going to probably ask us to grow and move past some obstacle um, that has kept us stuck, and probably not only in this therapy relationship, but elsewhere in our lives. Mm -hmm. What gets in the way of creating that therapeutic bond? What is it that patients or therapists would be doing or not doing that would decrease the likelihood that there'd be that warm, uh, open connection that you were talking about? Yeah, maybe I'll speak to the, the therapist end of this. I mean, there's probably an infinite number of errors we can make in this regard. Um, but I think, you, you know, Failure of curiosity and failure of humility are probably way up there in terms of mistakes that we can pretty easily make. Um, and the signals of that might be, um, you know, feeling bored or irritated, having that word should <laughs> float around. This patient should want to improve his relationship with his wife or he should want to leave his wife. <laughs> um, that when we, uh, again, start to think that we know what's right, um, then we're really distancing ourselves from the patient and, and not taking that step to show up to be willing with, to be with them as they are. And that can be very alienating and hurtful to someone. 
Mm -hmm. I've noticed that one thing that I do that gets in the way of the bond is being somewhat emotionally closed. I had a patient some years ago, lovely person was coming to me for help with PTSD symptoms, longstanding PTSD. Um, beautiful person, very intelligent, a lot of fun to hang out with. And saw her for a couple of sessions and the needle wasn't moving on any of the symptoms that she had asked for help with. So that was a sign to me that we weren't accomplishing that first goal that you had laid out, early progress. So she came to my office one morning and I asked her how she was and she started talking. And I noticed that I started feeling bored. And then I noticed that I had one of those should statements, not about the patient, but about myself. Mm. Well, Daniel, you shouldn't be bored when your patients come and talk about their suffering with you. You should be very interested and curious and find it very compelling. So I was shooting on myself there. And then I decided, no, I don't think I'll do that. I think I'll be more open-hearted th than I'm being right now. And so I asked the patient if I could interrupt and share something with her that was happening for me. And she looked a little surprised and said, sure. So I told her that, that I was somewhat embarrassed and worried about telling her this and that I'd noticed for the last couple of minutes, I, I was pretty bored <laughs> and kind of spacing out. I wasn't really listening to her any longer. And she had a, an immediate and, and very strong reaction. She said, oh my God, thank you for saying that. Me too. Mm -hmm. And I've had a hunch that everyone I've been talking to for the last 60 years it pretty soon gets pretty bored, but you're the first person who's been willing to actually say that. So these moments, perhaps this is what you're referring to in therapy, when we run into something, that, that the road gets bumpy, we feel bored, the, the patient gets angry with us or something. Those might be the, the entry into the gold mine. Mm -hmm. And if we have the courage and open heartedness to walk through that door, that might be precisely what the patient is wanting from us. And I find myself and probably everyone that I train somewhat reluctant to do that, at least around certain emotions. They're feeling great warmth or appreciation or admiration. For a patient, they might be willing to share that. But if they're bored or angry or irritated or feeling discouraged, they might say, well, that wouldn't be professional for me to say that. So I'll just not. And then what, what we miss there is that actually we will be saying it, but our behavior will be saying it, our bodies will say it instead of our words. And when we're acting our emotions out, it's always confusing and disconnecting. That, that degrades the bonds between us and the other person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that's such a great story. I, I love that idea that you are, um, you're really allowing yourself to come towards this patient by opening up to your own boredom. <laughs> and making, making yourself avail emotionally available to that emotion which um, it would be so easy to talk ourselves away from letting ourselves feel that. Mm -hmm. Or to start acting it out, mm -hmm. right? Changing the subject or <laughs> doing something else that's signaling, I don't like what's happening between us. Mm -hmm. This is boring or this is aversive. And then the patient would feel that, but they'd be confused. Why is Daniel wanting to talk about this other thing now? What's going on? Mm -hmm. So, uh, that 
open heartedness that I think some patients just bring right out of the box. And if, if we're meeting them in that open hearted way, we just get along like houses of fire, you know, from session one. But in some ways, it's the other cases that are more interesting and more growth producing for us and perhaps for our patients, where we have to struggle together to find each other in these challenging moments, to connect, to collaborate, to address the errors that we're making on both sides when it comes to either the bond between us or the, the collaborative work. Just on that note, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about a patient of mine who is so good at being able to um, tell me in a kind of moment to moment way when things aren't working well for her. And she'll, she'll notice, hey, I'm shutting down or hey, I'm starting to feel angry. And it's such a huge gift to the, it makes the treatment roll forward so smoothly and easily because she's so willing to share that process. And it's such good role modeling for us. And as a therapist, it can be easy to hide in the therapist chair and feel like we should be presenting something completely neutral, calm, and professional. Um, so that would be a, you know, if we give into that, it would be an anti-collaborative behavior on our part or a therapy interfering behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm regularly inspired by the open heartedness my patients bring to our work, that my students bring to our training together. And oftentimes realize, oh, they're way ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I get paid, you know. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Wonder if uh, we could touch bases on one other topic. Um, I think this is in the collaboration sector. We talk about homework and homework compliance, which sounds like something from the corrections system. Right, it just has this macabre sound, homework compliance. But um, we know that working on our lives between therapy sessions correlates with improvement. And so asking our patients to do this work is an important thing for us to do. What errors do you see therapists making in assigning homework? Mm. Yeah, um, well, uh, if it's assigned, gosh, there's, there's some infinite myriad number of errors, but um, assigning it in a kind of authoritarian, non-collaborative way. Um, uh, you know, there's certainly an art, we were talking about encouragement, right, to really building the case for why someone would want to uh, do homework. And when you said the word homework compliance, I thought, you know, the folks that I see really start to get better is when there's sort of this merger of diligence and enthusiasm mm -hmm. <laughs> is that, you know, it does require diligence. It's, it's, you know, it, it is work. You have to set aside time for it. Like you don't want to pretend it's not required demanding a certain something, but there can be this enthusiasm of under, of really being motivated as to a sense of purpose as to I'm, I'm really going to do this homework because I mm -hmm. see that this could take me somewhere. And I think as therapists, we can help patients build that case for themselves as to why they'd want to really commit themselves to doing something that can be so hard. Hmm. The word that comes to mind as I'm listening to you is salience. Hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the patient experiences the assignment as salient, their willingness to do it will go up. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they think this is Daniel's idea, but it's not going to do anything for me you know it just kind of pisses me off to <laughs> have one more thing to do when I already have too much to do then we've created a new problem mm -hmm. so perhaps that's another area of bond and collaboration creating homework that has those components that you're talking about mm -hmm. and then speaking encouraging words when the homework gets done uh, praising that choice, uh, admiring the, the commitment, the diligence that the person's bringing to creating a new life for themselves and their, their families, say. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that follow-up, right? So that, so that we convey that sense of that eagerness and curiosity and wanting to hear how it went. And, and, and maintaining that even if it didn't go well, 
right? If, if the homework wasn't done, right, then that's something to be interested in and explored. And there's probably some rich, important thing there for us to understand together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the assignment of the homework itself is an experiment. Mm. And then we'll get data. Person chooses to do it. They choose to do much more than that. They choose to do less. They choose to do something else. I had a patient this week say, no, Daniel, I didn't do that homework at all. I did this. <laughs> and it turned out that was a good choice, that that really was life-giving for them to work. It was more in the relational area than the cognitive area. So sometimes patients themselves know and are willing to take the wheel and then bring in the data and talk with us about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I am grateful to you for spending this time with me and talking about Therapeutic Alliance and some of our experiences of that. Um, anything you'd want to add before we say goodbye this afternoon? Um, well, well, maybe there was something about saying goodbye. This is a little... Uh, off the top of my head here, but that, um, you know, we think about collaboration as coming together to form a therapy alliance and do some good work together. And then there's also this collaboration of parting, <laughs> right, of, of letting go, which you could, is maybe the metaphor for sitting with open hands, that we're really able to see the patients as really perfect, just as they are. And, and we're not, we don't have this agenda for them to be different. We're kind of deeply accepting them. And, and part of what is happening for them is they might passionately want to work on something to change some part of their conditioning, and we would help them in that. But that we're not, um, we're not invested in them being different than they are. Mm. And I feel like that um, has required a lot of practice and diligence on my part to, to kind of come back to that stance instead mm. of having, getting caught up in my own vision of how um, they should be. Hmm. It's quite lovely. Reminds me of uh, something one of our colleagues shared with me recently. And, and he was talking about open hands. And he said, sometimes those can look like this. <laughs> and then we, we came up with this image of open arms. Mm. And we both liked that because it seemed to connote this embrace of the other and their choices, their situation. And I think when we can embrace that other, we're showing them that they can embrace themselves. Mm. They, they may have spent many years being very critical and rejecting of themselves. And I think that kind of self-rejection lies at the root of just about every uh, form of emotional suffering that I've seen. So being able to embrace them right here, right now, is showing them something that they can do if, if they would want to do that. And uh, perhaps at the end of the day, that would be, I only had one wish for myself and my students and patients, it would be that, to just learn to embrace themselves. Mm. Lovely. Well, um, virtual embrace to you. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> and thank you for sharing your wisdom, experience with, with me and with our listeners. And I uh, look forward to reconnecting with you again soon. Good. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you for joining Heather and I. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. If you did, consider subscribing to this channel. I'll look forward to having you back with us again soon.